my honor to be with Robbie Crabtree. How are you doing today, Robbie? I'm great, Steve. How are you? I am fantastic. Uh, you are a fellow entrepreneur, just like me. Um, well, you're a new to entrepreneurship, sort of kind of like, right? I am a former trial lawyer turned entrepreneur. So uh, I'm a little newer to this game than I think you are. Got it. So trial lawyer, why would anybody want to become a trial lawyer? I'm interested. I don't, I'm not criticizing. I just don't know the personality type of a trial lawyer. I have to imagine argumentative being part of that DNA, but I don't know. I like to think it's more about debate than arguing. It's about having discussion and finding, finding a way to the truth. That was always interesting to me. And the other part, this is like a, a bit, it's like a bit corny, cheesy, but it's the reality. I, I grew up loving superheroes and, and comic books and kind of, you know, all these like movies and television shows. And, and I wanted to be like the good guy. I wanted to be the James Bond. I wanted to be the, you know, Superman. I wanted to be those figures. And the, the best way that I saw being able to do that in, in many ways was to go and be a, a trial lawyer and represent people who had been harmed because most of my career was as a criminal prosecutor. And I, you know, was handling like really nasty murder cases and child abuse cases for most of my career. And so there was something really meaningful that tied into like the things that I loved as a kid about being able to step in and kind of be the Luke Skywalker, right. And bring balance to the, to balance to the force. Uh, I saw being a trial lawyer similarly. Wow. You just hit a nerve, uh, child abuse, meaning that's hardcore. I used to be an EMT and believe it or not, you take home some of that with you from an energetic perspective. I got to imagine that wearing on you, man. That was one of the toughest parts because to be a great trial lawyer, you have to be able to transfer emotion from, from yourself to the, the jury or the judge in any given case. The challenge there is in order to transfer that emotion, you have to take on that emotion yourself. So there was this victim to me, to jury. So to your point, it really does weigh on you and it's really, really heavy. And after a certain period of time, that's ultimately what led to, to leaving that work was because I just felt like I wasn't having as big an impact as I possibly could um, while still feeling really fulfilled. And like, I love the work I do and I have so much respect for my colleagues who continue to do that work. But it sticks with you. I think about the victims of the cases virtually every day. Like, it's no joke. I've been out of that now for five, six years. And like, I still think about the victims of the cases that I handled. That's, that's the toll it takes. Ouch. You know, I, the energy shift that you had was palpable for me when I mentioned it. And I'd never said that to you before. It brought you to a place. Yeah. Wow. I'm sorry to do that for you at the beginning. Cause we were like high level and all of a sudden we dove right into this. It's just part is is part of my my story. It's part of my own journey, right? And I, I I'm very used to it. But when I when I go to that, it is very it's a very heavy place to um to go, and it, it's very visceral. Um, so I don't mind going into it because it's something that people need to be aware of. It's something that's worth talking about. It's something that not much light is shown up like shined on. So most people have no idea that this sort of stuff is happening in everyone's backyards and and neighborhoods and communities and all sorts of things. And a lot of people who are are acting out or, or doing things is because they have some sort of trauma that they haven't shared. But, you know, most, most child abuse cases, I know we're going to talk about other stuff, but it's interesting because, you know, you get like about one out of 10 cases gets reported. There's nine out of 10 that no one ever hears about. So uh, I don't mind going into it, but it does, like it takes you to a very different place. There's just no way around it. Yeah. So I, I once heard that people, so you know what Scientology is? Yeah. Are you a Scientologist? I don't want to no. say, Okay, got it. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that, but like Tom Cruise um, and John Travolta, I am told are or were um, Scientologists. And when I wanted to find out more, because I knew somebody was trying to recruit me into it, and it's not my thing, but it is it is for them. I was told it was because when they had their roles, their characters, they would actually become that person, mm. envelop their traumas, their everything, and to get them out this methodology, I guess it's a religion, um, 
help them to shed that, uh, to shed all of that trauma. I, I can see that. I mean, in, you, you really do. I, I imagine it's the same to be great as an actor. You have to embody that so deeply. Uh, and I know there are like stories of this. Uh, I, I can't remember Charlie Hunnam who played um, Jack's teller in, in sons of anarchy. There was talk about like, he just basically became Jack's in real life in so many ways. Arrested, killed people, whatever. Yeah, like, but like the way he carried himself, the way that he spoke, like the way he dressed and like, you do take it on. And we've seen those stories of Heath Ledger with the Joker as well. And, you know, like I actually talk about this as, as well with people is sometimes it's good to actually create these alt, alt, alter egos, if you will. And I remember when I went into a courtroom and it's silly, it's like a silly thing, but you can create these anchor points. And I remember before every single trial, I have this five song playlist of Rick Ross songs. And I, like, don't ask me why Rick Ross, don't ask me why. It's just like, it created this, this feeling for me and I could snap into the, the person I needed to be inside of a courtroom in order to win. Mm. And that was part of, it did help me because when I was out in the normal world, I was able to like kind of shed that and be more normal and not the way that I had to be inside of a courtroom. Uh, but I can understand why an actor would want help getting out of that that space to kind of go back to their homeostasis, their their normal, because it can be really tough. Yeah, well, what you're describing is what we call, and Tony Robbins talks about this a lot. I've you know done any of Tony's stuff, but he uses um, a process of getting into state. Mm, yeah, so it could be your state for battle or so and your best self and music's a very big part of that light is a part of that um so he uses this process um that helps you get into that peak state to be able to fight or take out a challenge or be the best you can be or so on so that's what you were doing you were getting yourself into state but i like how you described it that you could segment your uh reality of things that okay here i am i'm in now I'm all in. I uh, I know that Tony does a little bit of that. That's interesting. It's always is one of the thing one of the things about life as a trial lawyer is much of of what we ended up doing. I you know we just kind of stumbled upon it because we found it worked. It wasn't because you know we had training or someone came like we read a bunch. It's just like you figure out the stuff that works and you do it, and then years later. You talk about it and someone's like, oh, that sounds like this or, oh, there's research to back that up. It's, it's I get this a lot with uh, like Chris Voss, the guy who did the FBI hostage negotiation. He talks a lot about tactical empathy and mirroring and all these different things. I'm like, oh, yeah, like those were abs like we've been talking about that inside of like the DA's office and like doing this. But like we didn't know who Chris Voss was. We didn't know any of this training. We just figured out how to mirror people when they were on a witness stand so that they we would get them to open up. Right. Because most people try to kind of you know get away from answering the question and if you're good you just mirror back what they said and then they'll open up and they'll explain a bunch more and then you you walk them down this path that they can't can't get out and i remember i was talking about this one time and someone was like oh you need to give credit to to uh to chris voss i didn't even know who chris voss was at the time when they like brought this up and i'm like i have no idea who this is they're like well he came up with this idea i'm like i like we were just this is like an idea i used in a courtroom uh, so it's interesting when you have that experiential side where like you learn these things and you real you later on realize that there are names and research to back up why they work. And I think what you just brought up there is a perfect example of that. Uh, Tony has done far more research on this than I have. Uh, it was just something that I found worked. Yeah, he uses a strategy. I forget the name of it exactly. It'll pop into my head, but it's sound, it's light, and it's motion in your body. Hmm. Yeah, there's a there's a name for it, and I'll I'll come up with it probably before this podcast is over. But um, there's a whole strategy, and you actually can learn it. There's a whole session. So what I hear you saying is that Chris Voss actually may have embodied this, and it's interesting because a lot of people, um, you know, say things, and then later on you find there's a whole bunch of research and credit behind it. That's brilliant. I love that. And sometimes we stumble upon it and we're like, oh, there's actually a rationale behind this versus it just worked. You know, like that's, that's, uh, it reminds me of like your parents, when your parents tell you to do something and they're like, just do it. And there's, there's no, that, you know, they, they won't necessarily have like a rationale, but then if you go deeper many times, there was, there is some scientific basis behind what they're saying. It's just been one of those things that's been passed on from like generation to generation that we know these things. I think it's so fascinating the way that these concepts and ideas and, and things 
take hold and we don't always know why they're the right thing to do, but like they end up being backed up at some point. So uh, again, I don't know. It's, it's fascinating stuff to me. We call it the unique naming strategy and whoever names it owns it. Right. So I know Chris, I saw him probably, I saw him two weeks ago. I saw him three weeks ago. I was talking oh. about some uh, combat veteran work that we're doing and uh, he was giving me a little help with that. And I, I was, anyway, I was at a conference and there he was again. He's like, hey, what's going on? Um, he's all about human psychology and the things that come naturally to you as a, you know, a, a, as a criminal lawyer or a trial lawyer, right? When you're doing your craft is something that you knew you had when you were younger and just developed it over time and then found the perfect way of being able to um, utilize it and make some money doing it, right? It's, it, it feels like magic, right? When you come across it, because it just becomes really effortless and it, it fires you up and you have that energy. I mean, going going to court while it was really heavy stuff. I mean, I tried 102 of them wow. in in the course of, of my, my career as a prosecutor, which is an obscene amount of cases to try, like very, very serious cases too. And, but it never felt, it never felt hard. And, and like, that's not to say that there wasn't hard work because there was, but it never felt hard to your point. Like this had always like been in my DNA and I was just, it's, I was finally able to like let that explode in a really meaningful way. And then that was, that was my career. So it, it feels like magic when you find it. Without a doubt, you were aligning with that. But, you know, I had the same experience that you had where you were embodying the trauma of the people that you were uh, representing because I I found that the best attorneys that I've ever had, um, I have this one guy, um, Joel Greenwald, and his partner, uh, Doherty, I think it's Jason Doherty, um, they never forgot any details of any case I was going over with them. Usually it was some sort of claim or whatever. And the reason that was really important to me, Robbie, was because I didn't want to relive the trauma again. Mm -hmm. Because when you're describing it, you're reliving it. Yeah. You know, it does, there is a process that you can go through to get rid of trauma. It's called EMDR, eye movement desensitization. And, and it does help you get through the trauma. But in reality, when you're doing what you were doing legally, these poor people were reliving it, being respectful to your request, but they were probably going to tears. They were probably feeling nauseous. They were probably re-experiencing, couldn't sleep at night and so on. And thank God for good attorneys that can remember all that stuff, you know, because when you get a detail um, wrong and you're, you know, you're, you're in court and you got it wrong and then you get called out, I bet that would feel terrible. That probably never happened to you. Well, everyone manipulates the facts, right? And so they're always calling out, but you're right. I mean, part of the job was also to, this is where attention to detail and, and love of the craft are so important. Mm. The idea of excellence is has always resonated really deeply with me. And I think it comes from that time. Because if I showed up and I was, you know, let, let's let's like use a an example. Lawyers are are infamous for for having drinking problems. And and I understand why seeing what I saw. But like let's say you show up to to work and you're hungover as as a lawyer. And so you're not sharp. And you have a witness interview. It's a child victim of a sex abuse case. And you're interviewing them and it's nine o'clock in the morning and you're not sharp. So like you, you go through the motions and, and you you let them leave. And then you realize two weeks later, I need to re-interview them because I didn't ask all the right things. And I missed some pieces and, and I wasn't really clear on some of this because you weren't paying attention that much. And now you bring them back down another time and you're asking them the same questions or different questions. And there creates a sense of, of will this ever end yeah. for, for the victim? So like you have, you have to, to obsess over excellence because you don't want to reach, like you want to make sure the, the re-trauma, which it absolutely is, you're spot on, you're 100% re-traumatizing them. You want to make sure that you re-traumatize them as little as possible. Yeah. Like that is, that is the goal. So if I, I could show up and get everything I needed at one time, I was done. And many of my, my, investigators and colleagues would be like, no, you need to like verify it a second time. I'd be like, no, like if they told me this, I know how to move forward and run the case and they'll only have to testify again there. 
And if there are any inconsistencies, like I'm prepared well enough to be able to explain those away. And I have such a compelling case and know how to present inside of a courtroom. Like that's where it comes into like, you have to be great at what you do because I knew that I could kind of like brush over some of the rough spots because yeah. I knew when I stepped into a courtroom, I would be a better advocate than was the defense attorney. And by being a better advocate, it meant that like I ha I didn't have to re-traumatize them as much. So this idea of excellence has always been really important because I don't want to re-traumatize people to your point. Uh, yes. And, and so not remembering details reduces the trust that that person has to you. And you're bringing them to two trauma states. One is the interview and the next is in court, which can get even more intense because it's out of your control. So I get it. And I understand more now why you've made this switch. Um, and you talk about competitive storytelling, right? You talk about storytelling. So you go from an attorney, trial attorney to storytelling. What the heck is that all about? The unlock for me was in an early case, actually, that I had, I lost this case. It was like my, my eighth jury trial ever. I lost the case. Very frustrating, especially to like a young, cocky uh, trial attorney at the time. And I had a slam dunk case. It was like a driving while intoxicated, nothing serious. No one got hurt. And I lost the case. And by all accounts, I should have won. But what I heard the jury tell the defendant at the end of the case, because you can talk to the jury afterwards. I talked to every jury. In fact, throughout my entire career, which is a really fun experience when you go back and you ask them, uh, be brutally honest with me. What's like, what did you hate? What didn't work? And just like rip me apart. And then they would, but you learn so much. But in this case, I listened to them talk to the defendant and they told him, young man, you know that you were guilty and we know that you were guilty, but we believed you when you said you want a second chance and that you would do better. And it was like there that I really, like I was, I was, I couldn't believe my ears because I, they just said I'd won, but I hadn't won. That sent me down this path of, okay, if, if being right doesn't mean they vote my way, I've got to figure out being right doesn't, isn't the point here. It's being right and also getting them to vote my way, which sent me down this, this like journey of how do the best lawyers do that? How do the best leaders do that? How do, and that really came down to, can you get up in front of people and tell a story that they rally behind that makes them believe the, that you are credible from the past? and that you are building this bridge to a better future and they want to go along with you. And if I could do that inside of a courtroom, what I found is I didn't lose. It like it didn't matter how, how hard the case was, it doesn't matter what had happened previously, I didn't lose. And that realization took me to seeing if I could do it inside of a another environment, which is when I went to SMU law school and started teaching trial advocacy to students and coaching the national mock trial team there to see like did it work? And when I saw it work there too, the same principles, which are very different than what most people teach inside of those worlds, because they're like very much factually based. And I was like, no, no, just like nail the storytelling, like figure out how to hook people, figure out how to create emotional themes. Like if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. Beautiful. It rhymes. It's Ooh. memorable. Like that's a beautiful theme. And, and then figure out how to dismount it. And if you create enough emotion throughout that and you weave in all of the other Aristotle, Aristotle and components of logos and ethos, right? Logic and, and credibility, you win. And that, when I saw that starting work, I was like, well, where does this also apply? It also applies to business leaders, especially the ones who want to do really big, impactful things with innovative technologies. So I said, that's like, there's this, this spot to go and work with them. And there's a lot more behind that, but that was kind of the genesis of it all. Well, that's what we're diving into, like, like getting into that role of being a storyteller. And you have a book that's coming out soon, right? I do. It breaks down a lot of the cases uh, that I tried and what I learned. And it's called competitive storytelling. And it's just, you know, the idea is take what I what I learned inside of a courtroom, which I think is, you know, about as high stakes from a storytelling perspective as you can find. Like I tell a story, the jury decides is the abuser going home with the, the victim to continue abusing them, or are they going to prison for the rest of their lives? Yeah. And I said, if I can distill this down into lessons that are, are very tactical, that are applicable to business leaders, and they can go and start executing on them, 
that that's that's worth it to me. So I wrote the book ar- around those ideas of of how do you become a great storyteller? Because if you are a great storyteller, then you have the ability to become a great communicator at large. Storytelling is that foundational piece to become a great communicator. You can't be a great communicator without being a great storyteller. So that's why I start here and say, if you want to get to like what a trial lawyer is, which is really a great communicator, you have to first understand how to be the most compelling storyteller possible because that's table stakes. Hmm. So how do you use this to make money for yourself and others? What do you do right now? There's a guy named Ted Sorensen. Ted Sorensen was the advisor and speechwriter for JFK. He was largely responsible for de-escalating the Cuban Missile Crisis. He wrote JFK's most famous speeches. And what I love about the JFK example is I believe he gave the most iconic technology speech in the world, which was the we'll put a man on the moon speech in 1962 at Rice University. Plus, he did a bunch of other stuff that were really big and impactful. And the way that he used his his speaking was what allowed him to do that. So what I do today is work with who I think are taking the biggest moonshots, if you will. And those are technology CEOs and founders who are building, you know, in these like really hard places. They're building in deep tech or they're building in AI, but doing it for the right reasons, not just to, to make a bunch of money. They're building in like new forms of energy and and really going after you know some of the most pressing problems we have on the planet. But if you look at those people, they don't have the communication skills and the storytelling skills necessary to rally people around them, right? Like they don't have that Jobs-esque charisma when they get on stage. They don't have the JFK speaking cadence and, and polish. So what I do is I work with these companies to help them, one, figure out what is the story they want to share with the world, And then two, how do you go about sharing that in all of the ways that are necessary from the CEO kind of at the top of the company? So to investors, to raise capital. So we've had a lot of success doing that to uh, your internal team at all hands meetings and making sure that everybody is inspired and energized and going the right direction to, you know, recruiting new people. Like how do you build out an incredible executive team who can actually take you where you want to go? And so we, we cover all these different things to make sure that these visionaries have the ability to articulate that future and makes people say, I want to go along for that ride. And I want to help you achieve that thing and turn it into reality. Mm, That's awesome. So you've been doing this with companies to help them tell their story better. Exactly. So I've been doing that for about three years. I've expanded that. Now I have you know, some partners that I work with where we actually run a strategic communication agency and, and actually go in and, and operate like a communicate like chief communication officer for many of these companies and build out messaging and help them distill it and understand like the simplification of that process and then how to deliver that. Because one of the things that, you know, I think a lot about is there's two parts to great communication, great storytelling, of course, is you have the content itself, right? Like what you're saying, that's the rhetoric, that's all the writing. And that's great. And you got to nail that. If you don't nail that, the delivery doesn't matter. But if you do nail the content and the writing piece and you can't deliver it, it falls flat, right? If you drone on, if you're, you know, just monotone or boring or any of those things, it gets lost. So the role is really to make sure that we create the right messaging and then we help them deliver it in a way that inspires people, that motivates them, that pulls them into it and really creates this magnetism to that company where people want to be involved. So that's like, that's been what, what I've been doing the last three years uh, in, in, in this world. So, you, so what do you do to get people into that mindset? Like, is there a first question you ask? I'm sure you ask what's the goal, but what do you do? What's your, what's your process from a high level? The process, as I think about it, when we start is it, it's really, um, essentially going in and diving in and pulling out all the pieces from them. I like to think about it a little bit like the way Michelangelo talked about creating David, where to him, David was already inside of the block of marble and it was his job to like chisel it away and release David from its prison. I tell every person I work with, like you have the story, like you have the messaging inside of you. It's like, I'm not here to, to create something. I'm here to find what is already there and release it. I'm here to figure out how to 
make sure I chip away the right thing so that the sculpture looks incredible from every angle. So the first piece that I go through is I just tell them like, look, we've got to spend some time where like you have to let me in your head and like really deep stuff. So I tell them like, you're going to have to be extremely vulnerable with me. You might cry with me. You might get angry with me. You might say, I don't want to do this anymore. This is too, too tough. Like this sucks. You might say all these things. I'm like, if we were saying those, we're probably on the right path. And so that is really where we start is just like understanding what this is going to look like to build the block of marble. And I say, once I've got the block now, like, let me go run. Like I know how to chisel away. I know how to like sit in it and feel it and find my way to like, where is David? I'll, I'll see it. And then I just start sharing and we go back and forth, back and forth. But that's like the first piece. And then the, the question I always start with any person that I want to work with is it's a very simple, um, but also a very large and open-ended question. And it's tell me the biggest, boldest, most ambitious vision you have. And they'll normally be like, oh, well, what do you mean? I'm like, everything goes right. Every single thing that you can picture goes right. You have all the capital you need, all the people you need, the, the market dynamics are perfect. Like, tell me what that looks like. Because I've got to get them dreaming in the biggest way possible so that we can really figure out, okay, like what is a story that's going to enable that to feel like it is tangible and has a chance of becoming true? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been smirking and kind of interior, I mean, a little bit of thought when you were talking. I was sitting with one of my uh, people who work on, in, in one of my IT uh, division of my company. And I said to him the same words. I said, you ever hear Michelangelo talk about the block of marble and so on? And he looks at me and he says, not exactly, but I think I know what you mean. SpongeBob did something like that where Squidward was trying to carve and then SpongeBob comes over and with one hit, boom, all of a sudden there was this beautiful sculpture of David. So I was kind of laughing about that, but then reflecting on shifts of energy. And so when we first started talking, it was high. And then I asked you about what you did and then talked about the trauma that people had happen. It was like instant. And I don't know if everybody or maybe just you and I superhumans can detect that. But I think there's a certain aspect of that that happens in a room when you're talking to a group. And what, what I hear you saying is, you bring them to the to that state, right? Like we started talking with Tony Robbins, but you bring them to that conclusion or that you know pinnacle of of their um, success that they could have. And if you can keep them psychologically in that space, it just is going to happen, right? I like I like to tell people my like the the way that I talk about things is. My job is to to help you take things from impossible to inevitable. Got it. And we have if we get that big idea right, like if we help them get there, once they've been able to really see it and feel it in their head and we've talked about it, now now we can make that inevitable because I can we can create the messaging. We can create the story that gets you there. And my fundamental belief why language especially is so important is the language is the operating system of civilization there is there is nothing there is nothing else that allowed civilization to flourish except for language we can trace it through history i was a history major as well and we can trace when did civilization start to take off it started to take off when we started speaking when we started telling stories because we were able to transmit information and bring people in these tribes and in these groups and those groups were able to form religions and those religions were able to form cities and, and then cultures and then civilizations and then empires. And so if you look at it, we've, we are running on language. So if we can figure out what is that biggest, boldest, most ambitious vision that you have, put words to it and then write the words that are going to help us achieve that, we create the operating system for that person to actually make that come true. Like we are just using the, 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 thing that has already enabled us to do such extraordinary things in the world as humans. And we're now just allowing that individual or that company to tap into it and pull that power instead of just letting it live in their head. Because thoughts 
are not the operating system of civilization. Words and language are the, are the operating system. So we have to actually turn it from thoughts to words. Got it. So do you, does the message change based upon the audience? Yes, because you have to think you all communication should be audience centric, which is empathetic. I should never be speaking just because I want to speak. Right. When I come on here to talk to you, I could pontificate about things that I just think are interesting all day. But like, that's not why I'm here. I'm here because I want people to understand, like, here's how you can use it. If they take away this idea that if I take the ideas in my head and put words to them, they can come true. That's that's valuable. Like that is something that can change the the course of their lives. So no matter who it is, if you're talking to an investor, you're talking to a team member, maybe it's a junior team member versus senior team team, team member. Those are going to be very different ways that you approach talking to them, right? This happens all the time with entrepreneurs and and you know founders and executives. They think talking to a customer is the same as talking to an investor because in their eyes they're selling to both of them. Except the customer psychology is wildly different than the investor psychology. So of course we have to think about what what are the the structure of the story of the message because we might need to lower resistance in different ways. We might need to use different terminology because an investor might care a lot more about hearing buzzwords that they know can help them pattern match. But a customer, those buzzwords are only for investors. The buzzwords that a customer needs are, do you understand my pains, which is very different. So we're always adapting this messaging. So the messaging should be firm, but with the ability to be flexible so that we can identify the right target audience for that messaging and really nail it. Makes sense. So, you know, we were talking about Chris Voss earlier, the negotiator, mm -hmm. right? And you were talking about his process and which you had used, um, you know, in, in, in your cases, and then could put a, a name with the process. I had learned that years ago in a thing called redemptive listening. And it's interesting. Redemptive listening was where you, you don't parrot, but you just simply... Uh, review what a person just said or something like that without being obnoxious. And it actually lowers a person's resistance because hmm. they feel heard. And in the name of my first book is Pitchology, The Art and Science of Raising Capital for Entrepreneurs. It was supposed to be called Pitch Slapped. And it wasn't supposed to be a derogatory statement meant to any do anything other than to remind the pitcher, the person looking to raise capital, to listen. Because when you're pitch slapping, you're just going through your Zoom call and your, you know, your pitch deck, and you're not really caring about the body language of the person on the other side, if they raise their hand and they have a question or so. So how do you prepare people? Because like when you were in court, you had to come up with some odd questions that came out of left field. What is it that you, how do you prepare people for those sort of things, especially if they're not accustomed? Like I have a, a researcher in mind who actually makes human organs out of stem cells, right? But she's not a great, person to pitch or talk and raise capital she'll get all flustered if people change the message on her and ask her a different question so how do you deal with that i do have to say before i start i'm glad you changed the title to pitchology instead of pitch slap <laughs> you and a whole bunch of women that i was working with they were like you call it that i'm never reading your book i'm like all right i'm don't look to offend anybody because I think pitch slap plays into more of like the fear and the negative side and pitchology is more hope and positive. And I personally love the more hopeful and positive messaging. That's always, always been kind of what I've gravitated towards. And the book is great. So like I, it, what it did is it set like a much more positive frame going into it, which I love because if I would have seen pitch slap, I would have, that would have turned me off because that feels very negative. And that's not like the going back to energy. That's not the energy. Like I necessarily want to be taking and consuming because I, I think it's so important the 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 energy sources we take in really do inform the way that we show up in the world too so anyways I, i'm glad you changed it and, and it showed in the book because it was great thank you very much but to to answer your question when when i think about you know i, I work with a lot of highly technical people you know P, phds scientists like 
you know, ac academics, all that sort of stuff. That's the nature of a lot of the work that, that I do. And so when you're working with those people, it's, there's a process to prepare them around like, what is the core message that we want to get out and how can you make sure that you're going to be able to deliver the core message. And part of the way that we make sure that we can deliver the core message is by making sure we build a little bit of connection at the beginning with the person. You know, I, I've actually found one of the most successful things for the, you know, the founders and entrepreneurs and, and people I work with when they go out to raise capital is ask the investor to tell you a little bit about themselves, ask you to tell them their story. Like, why are you here? Why are you doing this? And it changes the dynamic very quickly from this transactional world where like they're here to like dig into the facts, 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 facts to, oh, okay, like we're normal human beings having a normal conversation and, and you're going to let me speak and I'm going to let you speak and then we'll get into like the back and forth. So it changes a little bit of that dynamic, which is why I think like the way that we set the frame at the beginning of the conversation is so important, especially for the academics, the scientists, the PhDs, you know, the the people who are these, you know, savants and and all of the, the quants out there who who like need to be able to speak uninterrupted. And then it's about creating the core message in a bite-sized way that doesn't feel overwhelming. Like we have to simplify, we have to lower the cognitive load. And we have to make it tight enough where we're not speaking for 10, 15 minutes because then they're going to want to interrupt. But if you are delivering for five, six minutes and it's simplified language that demonstrates expertise, they'll listen. And if they do jump in, what we train them to do is say like, hey, I'll, like that's a great question and it flows perfectly. I've got about three more minutes of this. I think it will, it will give you some additional context and then we can talk about that. And then I'll have them go right back into it. And then we get question and answer. Part of that, again, is, is there's two pieces to successful conversational skills at that level when you're presenting and trying to raise capital. There's macro preparation and micro preparation. Macro preparation are all the skills that you develop around how you just communicate generally. So building set pieces, thinking about strategies that I like to call, do we want to answer this with a story or a structural answer? A structural answer is like, hey, there's three parts to this answer. The first is this, second is this, third is this. Let me go into one first. So we give them all these tools in this macro preparation way. And then micro preparation is, look, like, Steve, me and you know the types of questions investors are going to ask someone. Like, we've done this enough. We, we can pretty well guess what are the questions going to be. So we can do this micro preparation where we say, here are the 25 questions that we think are going to make or break your ability to, to raise capital. Well, now let's go and let's like work on those. Let's build answers and help you practice those specifics. So when you hear and realize the 25 questions could be asked five different ways, but they're still all tied back to those 25 core questions. So you just have to be able to map, hey, when they ask this, it's actually tying into this, this question, which I've already answered and I give this answer and now you go. So that's how I think about dealing with those people is we give them a lot of structure and guidance so that it's almost just like pulling from the side and saying, oh, here's my answer, go. Got it. And I think there's a technique that people use in order to think on their toes, which is, that is an amazing question. And they just add a couple words. A, it makes the person feel like they're smart and, you know, are engaging. And then it kind of gives you a minute to think about it. Do you give people like those sort of fillers, for th for example? Those need to be used not overused sparingly because if you're always saying that's an amazing question it gets dry and feels disingenuous yeah so i actually train a lot of people on get a lot more comfortable in silence if someone asks you a question and it takes you five seconds in silence to think through the right answer and structure it and make it concise that is five seconds that is worth its weight in gold mm. versus rushing in and trying to answer. And now what should have been a 30 second answer, because you didn't really think about it before you jumped into it, you give a two and a half minute answer that feels like it was rambling and all over the place. And people get worried about the pauses. They're like, oh, I'm going to be judged for pauses. Go back and look at Steve Jobs answering questions, huge pauses. Go and look at Elon Musk more recently, huge pauses when he's answering questions. And you can see this across many, many leaders. Those are just like two very obvious ones. There's many who do this, 
where the question you have a lot more time and silence than you think. Plus, there's been a study done where we, the person who is sitting in silence, like the the person who's supposed to respond, we generally think when we've been in silence for about fifteen se- like fifteen percent of the total time that the other person would allow, we think that we've gotten to hundred percent of that time. So, like if someone would normally, you know, say give you sixty seconds, we think like at not six seconds, like let's say 60 milliseconds and we're like 10 milliseconds in, we think, oh no, they're waiting on me. When in reality, they haven't even noticed that you're taking taking a second to pause. Hmm. Man, it's funny. It reminds me, I live part-time in Georgia and we had to learn a podcast that I had watched. I think it's called uh, How I Built This or maybe mm-hmm. it was one of the NPR. They talked about the pregnant pause and in Georgia, they practice the pregnant pause. And what's really interesting is during the pregnant pause is where often you get the best information. And there's your your opening for, you know, I'm going to do it or whatever. And you just stuck your foot in your mouth by stepping on top of the person's thought process. And they decided... You know, I'm going to wait for this New Yorker to keep talking. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> it's a good one. I mean, I'm from Texas, so I definitely understand the uh, the the pausing and being a little bit slower in the way that we speak. And I is there's just so much value. There's there's so much value. Also, it just demonstrates so much confidence and 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 in yourself when you're just willing to kind of sit and spend the time that you need to think and get it right for someone. And I think it's also very thoughtful for the other person, because I don't want to waste your time. Like, I want to get the answer right for you. I want to deliver the message that you, you asked me a question. I want to get it right for you. And if that takes me a couple seconds to sit and pause and figure out what it is, I think that's a sign of respect personally. And I've seen that play out well uh, with the people I work with. Again, it's, it's uh, an opinionated approach. Not everyone agrees with it, but, but I've seen it work well in, in the work that I've done. Without a doubt. I mean, you said it right. Um, it shows confidence because I mean, when somebody is nervous, they'll just chatter and just fill the word, you know, fill the air with words, which are unnecessary and unimportant. But when you're thoughtful about those words you use, then it becomes, you know, pretty, pretty great. Exactly. So you and I have something in common. Um, We share the gift of perfectionism. (laughs) Hmm. Um, And it was once explained to me as a disease um, in that when you're leading teams, perfectionism is the yeah, but, you know, hey, we're celebrating our win. And the perfectionist leader says, yeah, but did you get this done? And did you get this done? And you get this done. And then I heard a whole different description, an evolved description of perfectionism, which I just want to give to you as my gift to you today. And it's in, um, it's the Greek word. Those Greeks had great Mm -hmm. words for everything, right? They had three words for love. Their interpretation of perfectionism is a lifelong journey. And I believe it's teleos. Mm. And you spend your life looking to achieve that. And I felt that was a lot better than it being a disease And you putting that on everybody else. And so I actually gave perfectionism up for 10 years. And it happened after I stepped on a Lego. My three-year-old son was playing with Legos and I was wearing no shoes. And my wife was home with my son. And I screamed and I said nasty things. And I was upset with myself and I gave it up. And I realized after 10 years, I like to do things in chunks, years and so on. I realized nothing was satisfying because I was like 80, 90% on a lot of things. And so I decided to become very, very focused on what it is that I was working on and not let the little things, things that were unimportant, get all that energy because it's a waste of energy, perfectionism. And I find that to be rampant inside of entrepreneurs where they're really, really hard on themselves. And they have a challenge, and I think you alluded to this before, um, being vulnerable. But I think it's probably one of the most attractive things that you can do with an investor is to say, hey, I went bankrupt, and this is what happened. And 
I learned my lesson. That's never going to happen again or whatever. What do you think about that vulnerability? I mean, of course there's levels, but I mean, do you encourage them to be vulnerable? Or you say, no, I have only the Facebook picture and all that other jazz going on. I love the reframing of perfectionism. Uh, I see the world in frames all the time. I mean, that, that is like being a trial lawyer is just framing everything. And so I love a good reframe. I always tell people, the, like lots of uh, people will speak and they think they have this like amazing frame. What is it like, say like they're, they're building a company and they're like, we've done all of this on no marketing spend. And they think that's like a great frame. It's a great selling point, right? I'm like, that's wonderful. But here's the opposite side of that frame. You have not shown what it costs you to acquire customers. You have no way of knowing like how repeatable, like if we, like, what do you need to get to a hundred million dollars? How much is that marketing spend going to be? Like you don't have that number to tell an investor. So to them, you saying that we did this all with no marketing spend is kind of scary because that means there's a huge unknown that a great business is going to know these numbers. Right. It's just an example, but like you did such a beautiful job of, of reframing perfectionism. So I, I love that. Thank you. From a vulnerability per perspective, I like real, like I like real vulnerability. And, and I'll, I'll explain what I, I mean by that. There's been this run, at least what I have seen on social media and, and even publicly of people creating this like performative vulnerability of trying to get attention by being so vulnerable. And I think when we try, when people try to get attention from vulnerability, it is inauthentic in and of itself. This is why I say, it should be real vulnerability. Mm. To your point, talking about someone who went through a bankruptcy and how that informed them and what they learned from that and how they're going to make sure it never happens again. That's real vulnerability. Talking about how, you know, you cried yourself to sleep because you had to let 15 people go the other day from your company and sharing that as vulnerability feels very performative. Now, it doesn't mean that letting people go is not a, a negative thing and not a sad thing and, and any of these things. But oftentimes we can look behind that and be like, if you if you really were that sad, there were other options available to you that you could have taken. But like you wanted the world to see you as something. So you put out this thing saying I'm being vulnerable when it was really just for performance and, and inauthentic. So I think that's like the line. I always work with the founders to be vulnerable with people because that's, that's how we connect. And along those lines though, vulnerability does need to be framed properly. Sometimes people hear the word vulnerability and they just dump everything out there. Oh yeah. Right. Let's go back to the child abuse stuff. I, I, like there's lots of people who have been abused and like, if you're being vulnerable, you could talk about that, but there are some people who just like are not ready to hear that if you just dump it on them because it, maybe they were a victim or maybe it's just like too dark for them. And you're, your vulnerability is going to shut someone down. Like I can't just go, you know, we talked about being a child abuse prosecutor, but we didn't go into the details of the cases and what I saw because most people would not be able to deal with that. Like I remember at the end of my cases with, without fail, a number of the jurors would need therapy afterwards. And they would ask me after the case, where can I get services? Wow. Because this, this is like just too much for me to deal with. All right, yeah. So you can't like, but so I could be vulnerable and share some of the things that I saw, but it's too heavy for people. So we also have to be aware of, and this goes back, this is where like all these things tie together in really interesting ways. We talked about empathetic and audience centric communication. And when we think about our audience, we think about what vulnerability should I share with them that they're going to be able to resonate with and see me in, in the way that they need to and not share with them things just because I want to share with them. Like, that's that's the difference. So that's what I would say about vulnerability. Got it. It has to be appropriate given the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Got it. I call yeah. it in, in in first book. I said, don't open the kimono on the first, you know, first <laughs> eight. Um, I remember that. That was funny. Yeah, I mean, it's like when you ask every single person you're going to pitch to or propose to to sign a, a non disclosure agreement. It's like sorry, uh, we're not even dating yet. And you want to know, you know, what size dress I am? I don't think so. Like, it's just not okay. Um, what a great value. And you are in such a great position. You know, having been a criminal prosecutor, you know, being the superhero with the cape for these people who have been through 
you know, crazy abuse and things that you took so viscerally. That's actually one of my favorite words, visceral, because that's like, it ties right to your heart, your soul. And then evolving to be this great person that is able to help on the story side of things, prepping somebody to be able to do a capital raise or a marketing campaign. You know, it's just, it's a, it's a re, in a, an amazing use of your gifts and talents in a way that's so unique and creative. I'm like, wow, that is really cool. I want to hire you. This is great. Well, I appreciate it, Steve. And I'll, I'll, I'll tie it all, all together quickly. The reason this all makes sense to me is because what I saw in that world of being a trial lawyer was these were fixable, solvable problems. Are we going to be able to remove child abuse across the board and remove, you know, gang crimes and, and, and some of the horrific things that I saw and, you know, domestic violence and all that sort of thing? No, we can't remove it entirely, but we can make it less. We can make it better. And the way that we make it better is we have to fix a lot of the things that, that will allow more resources to flow there that give technology to some of these, these, you know, agencies who need it. We need to be able to fix some of like the underlying problems, like access to after school care and low income housing and like lots of these different things. And to me, the way that I saw, I couldn't solve them as a prosecutor because as a prosecutor, I just dealt with the cases as they came in after the fact, but the work that I do here, if we create enough value, if we build really successful companies who are working to do good in the world, and that's, that's critical. It cannot be just build big companies. It has to be build big companies that are doing good in the world and making a positive impact downstream. That's how we get less of those cases. And that's always been the thing that has driven me because I know what's possible when we achieve what's out in front to fix some of the things that I saw and have unique insight in back from my child abuse days. Got it. Wow. So you said you work with a group or, or, or you have a company. What is the name of that company? The company is Sornborn, S-O-R-E-N-B-O-R-N. Got it. And go ahead. Yeah. And what do they do exactly? And how and how would people find you on the yep. Yeah, so we do strategic communication work for um, you know companies that are post Series A all the way through IPO companies. Typically, those companies are in the deep tech, AI, or climate tech spaces. Um, occasionally they will be outside, but that's really kind of our sweet spot. I, I love those worlds because it feels like sci-fi to me uh, in many ways. And I love sci-fi and fantasy. So we do all that work. Uh, you can find me on my LinkedIn. It's probably the easiest way. Uh, website will be sorenborn.com uh, to, to check out. And then, you know, people can email me as well. It's pretty easy. Uh, Robbie at RobbieCrab.com. Uh, that's an easy way to get in touch with me. But yeah, we, we work with companies to make sure that they tell great stories, you know, create messaging and, and strategies and narratives that rally people around them who are going to help them achieve those big outcomes. And we get to have a lot of fun doing it, work with really cool people. And uh, I, I, I get fired up every day. So it's kind of like a business retreat sort of, right? For people to come in and really roll up their sleeves and start talking about messaging and things, you would facilitate something like that? We'll normally come in and actually like work inside of the company, almost like a fractional chief communication officer. Um, where we'll like, I love the Ted Sorensen piece where he was like that advisor to JFK. And I want to be able to do that with some of the best, uh, the best leaders out there. So to come in and like really get in their brain, sit beside them, strategize, figure out all the messaging pieces, dial it in and help them go out and really execute on it. Amazing. And so your st book, Competitive Storytelling is about to come out, which is yep. awesome. And in there, we'll hear some stories about cases that you actually prosecuted is that right i mean and, and so they're going to be gut-wrenching rough stories to have to deal with but how you were able to articulate that story in a way that actually was able to, to um get that person uh the person that you were up against put in prison or put in jail exactly they'll get to, to see inside of a courtroom and see what I learned in that journey of being a trial lawyer and then the ways that those lessons will apply to them as CEOs and executives out in the business world. Got it. And I just got to ask you, how was it writing that book? 
Well, the perfectionist in me came out. Uh, it was it was writing it. And then when you finish writing it, you start editing it. And then when you finish the edits, you're like, oh, I've got new ideas. So I should go back and rewrite some pieces. And then you've got to re-edit. And finally, you just got to say enough is enough. Uh, I'll write more books down the road, but we got to get, we got to turn this one loose to the world. That's right. It's not the only one. Well, thank you so much, Robbie Crabtree, for joining me today. This is really valuable. It's so important to be able to tell your story in a way and to have a person as, you know, as educated and experienced in this area. And then to actually work with companies is just so valuable. I think most people have no clue that a resource, a person like you exists until today. Thanks so much for having me, Steve. I really appreciate it. It was great. My pleasure. My pleasure.